So essentially what I will talk, and thank you, by the way, for inviting me. Uh, I'm extremely happy to be here. So essentially what I will be talking about is uh, are different ways of looking at uh, light-boosted uh, digest resonances. The main uh, thrust of my The main thrust of my talk is really jet energy coelters, and it'll define what they are. Uh, but I will sort of try to cover various aspects of how you look at how you should look at digit resonances in the event that we have a discovery. We, I know we have we don't have a discovery, but indeed, if we do, we have to sort of characterize how the resonances look like, and can we say something more about the resonance uh, in terms of how they're produced, in terms of its spin and color structure? And whether uh, whether or not once we do see something, if it's if we can quickly make a statement about its nature. So these are the mascots of Michigan State. Uh, if you go to a football match, by football I mean not soccer. By football, it's in the American sense. Um, you will in fact see these mascots everywhere. And uh, I'll later show a, an actual mascot, but let's wait for that. I guess I'm not st strong enough to be. <laughs> uh, so this is work done in association with my collaborators at MSU. And if you're more interested, you can uh, check up this link. OK, so this is sort of the status of Exotica Search. And unfortunately, all we have are limits and nothing else. Uh, limits, of course, depend on what you're looking at, the couplings, the various benchmark points. So this is a broad summary. It's just a sort of a you know, broad overview of things. And all these limits, of course, as you know, have to be taken with a pinch of salt. But of course, when I was a graduate student, I was told that you would find uh, new physics. But we haven't. And so depending on where you are, whether some are in their, in their deathbed, some are crawling, some are in wheelchair, uh, well, we are still BSM hunters. So we sort of try to keep calm and collide hadrons. Right. This is there's something wrong here. My slides next slide has a oh okay. Right. So the simplest thing to look for new physics resonances, one of the simplest things I should say is just pure resonances. And the DiJet channel is, of course, as you know, and uh, as uh, CMS and Atlas have been searching for DiJet resonances throughout. And it's really a powerful probe. It's, it's a simple thing to do. And in an event display, you would really see two back-to-back DiJet uh, events. The question is, of course, once if you do see it, and of course, we believe that we will see something, um, what is it? And is there a way of categorizing these in terms of uh, in terms of its really its 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 field theoretic structure, so the outline of what I'm going to say is essentially how to characterize digit resonances. I will use benchmark models just to highlight the differences between various types of models. But this is not an exhaustive list. It's just to highlight how different things can affect certain observables in different ways. So. I will talk about the so-called color discriminant variable, and this is really for broader resonances. Uh, and then there are these two really interesting methods uh, to look for narrow light digest resonances. The first one is called a jet energy profile, and the second one is, as I will say, jet energy, as I will talk about the bulk of my talk as jet energy coelters. OK, so let's, so instead of going into the details of the model, et cetera, et cetera, so I'll keep referring to this cheat sheet. And the cheat sheet is really looking at different kinds of models. So I have a leptophobic. So for all of this talk, I will be only dealing with leptophobic objects. And so there is the leptophobic Z prime, which, as you know, is a color. It's a vector, but it's colorless. There's a color on model, which is just taking two copies of SU3 and breaking it down to a vectorial SU3. Uh, this is an octet, but this is a vector. There's a scalar octet, and these generally appear in uh, some string theoretic construction. There are, so this is an 8 of SU3, if you like. This is a 6 of SU3. This is a sextet diquark. And there are excited quarks. This is a 3 of SU3. And you have a spin 2, which is again colorless, but it has a spin 2. And there are these dominant decay modes of each of these. So the leptophobic Z prime 
dominate, uh, decays dominantly to QQ bar. The color on, again, it's produced and decays to QQ bar. The scalar octets and spin twos are generally the dominant decays always uh, gluon to gluons. The sexted diquarks and excited quarks decay as QQ and QG. So let's see if we can uh, some do something by looking at the decay, by looking at the color structure uh, of these uh, objects. So before that, let's also remind ourselves what the limits are. So these are really for high mass uh, resonances. So this goes down to about a TeV. And you can see that the limits are about 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3 picobar-ish. Uh, remember that when you reinterpret this in, in terms of a coupling, uh, the Z prime is like a Z. So the Z has a cross-section of about 10 to the 5 picobar. Now, since your principal background here is QCD, as you go down in this mass, your QCD background is sort of swamps everything else. And so that's sort of the ballpark number that you can go down with uh, these uh, masses. How you look at right, light resonances is, of course, uh, an interesting issue, and I will come to that in next. But before that, let's also look at broader resonances, high mass resonances. And the one thing that I will talk about here is uh, the so-called color discriminant variables. And again, let's go back to the cheat sheet, and let's talk about these two models. One that is uh, dominantly decaying to QQ bar. Both are dominantly decaying to QQ bar. But there's one that's colorless, and then there's one that has a color 8 of, SU, 8 of SU3. So let's look at a generic cross-section structure for both. And for all purposes, you can sort of factorize the cross-section into a branching ratio, a factor that depends on luminosities, masses, etc., and a prefactor where the difference really is this factor 8 versus factor 1. Right? And if you assume that these are universal flavor coupling, you can immediately define a discriminator, a variable called D color. And I can define this as some m cube over gamma times sigma jj. And the only place where this will differ is in this initial color, stru color structure. Right? So this is, of course, useful whenever the width is measurable. It's broad enough. And what it distinguishes directly is the color structure of the resonance. Right? Because that's all that I'm looking at. I'm looking at a factorizable object with flavor universal couplings and some prefactors that sit in uh, sit, sit here. So let's see how this works in principle. So this is a plot of color on versus leptophobic model. And this is a log plot of the color discriminant variable. And you can see that these are pretty well separated. Okay? Uh, of course, the assumption here, of course, always is that I can measure the width. And if you can measure the width, there is at least a patch of parameter space where these are very well separated. Uh, so this is some work that was done later uh, in, uh, in 2015 uh, by these authors. And it sort of gives you an idea of, so this, of course, has pitfalls. You can't go to too low a width. You, there are always patches of parameter spaces where this will merge. And, but there is, of course, this range of masses and some couplings and some, uh, some width where this is pretty well separated. Uh, let's now look at narrow resonance. So let's look at light objects. And for light objects, the standard technique that we use is jet substructure, right? So this helps in background reduction. This helps in classification of jets. And the standard way you look at is this classic example where you have a Higgs decaying to BB bar. You do something called a mass drop, which is essentially just symmetrically separating this into two components and looking at the leading radiation. So you filter out everything else, right? You keep one leading radi uh, radiation. What you essentially do is you construct a fat jet, you step back, you, re uh, you, you go back in one step of clustering history and identify a hard splitting. Now what in generally in all substructure algorithms, and for, for, for good reason, what you do is to just take once one, one leading radiation. And that's mostly because you want to avoid all the underlying event, all the contamination, everything. So you basically do something called a filtering, right? But then you have radiation, which carries a lot of information about the resonance to start with itself, which you generally miss because of this whole filtering uh, object. Uh, so remember that the separation between these two objects generally depend on a splitting function, right? On, on the PT of the object. And for equal splittings, uh, for if the splitting function is half, this goes as twice m over PT. But radiation, of course, the jet has a mass. And the jet mass, of course, depends on how, how you measure the jet mass. In principle, you should always look at 
splittings and radiation. And if it's a gluonic radiation versus a, uh, versus a quark radiation, there is this factor CF and CA sitting in front of it. Right? And this is what should distinguish what object it is to start with. Because you're looking at a resonance that decays to two jets. And radiation of CA or CA, CF or CA, if you, if you keep track of these radiation patterns, should tell you what the initial starting re resonance was. So, of course, we know that jet substructure is extremely useful. It looks at highly collimated object that contains most of the energy. It has measurable macroscopic properties, meaning you can measure its mass, transverse momentum, radius, rapidity, etc. And it has information about the nature of heart process. But most often we neglect or we filter away, and again for good measure because you really want to get rid of the QCD background, etc. But it does carry information. So let's look at how that works out. So if you look at a general radiation cascade, you look at an endpoint starting uh, cross-section, and you look at one subsequent radiation. So you can just parameterize this as some d sigma n times a splitting function. The splitting function, of course, depends on whether this is a quark splitting or a quark gluon splitting or a gluon gluon splitting, right? So if it's a quark quark splitting, it has this familiar function. The quark gluon, of course, has a function that's not just there is the pole here, 1 minus z, in both quark quark and quark gluon. In the quark gluon case, you have this you have this straightforward function. And generally, the emission is determined by this Sudakov probability. And the Sudakov probability is just exponentiating this splitting function, right? Now, for a gluonic emission, since CF is CA, CF is greater than CA, you should always expect the gluonic jet to radiate more and at wider angles, right? So let, that brings me to the first of these uh, methods to look at uh, narrow resonances, and that's called the jet energy profile. So what do you do in a jet energy profile? Look at a fat jet, and what you do is inside this fat jet, you make concent concentric center circles of R. Now, the average fraction of the jet PT lying within this subcone is generally given by this function, right? So you can define this function, which is just looking at the PT within a small r and PT within the bigger fat r. Again, since I said that quarks are gluons radiate more than quarks, you should expect that this function should be broader for a gluonic jet and smaller for a quark jet, right? And so this is a uh, from this paper by CP1 uh, et al. And what they did was to do this, look at this, looked at this observable, did a full resummation, and came up with this variable. And I'll just, this is, a, uh, this is a plot where you look at a gluon resum distribution versus a quark resum distribution within this cone R. Okay? And this is within a PT of 8200. Okay, so let's split up this profile. So this Psi JJ is the total dijet energy profile. And this has two components. So that has two axes, basically. And you're looking, at, you're looking at the energy fractions within these concentric circles within fractions of, fractions of these radii. Okay? And if you look at this structure, you will immediately notice that given that the quark gluon radiates more, the amount of energy in larger circles will always be more than smaller circles for a radius R. And that's what you essentially see. Once you normalize this, you notice that the gluonic, the scalar octet, which is this green curve, has a significantly lower value compared to a quark gluon, compared to a QQ. And that's because it's normalized in a way so that the gluon gluon is uh, smallest. Again, let's go back to the cheat sheet. And now you know that for every object that has this octet structure, a sestet structure, you can distinguish this from a leptophobic, uh, from a colorless object. Right? Yeah. But that sort of is a first approximation. And let's see if we can do a, a bit more with it. In the sense that it's not just the color structure, right? The, these operators have more information in them. In particular, it has information of whether this is coming from a higher dimensional operator, whether it has explicit momentum dependence, whether it has some Lorentz structure that depends on its, uh, depends on its tensor, tensor objects, et cetera, et cetera. So again, I always urge you to look at this block and categorize, note, look at these in terms of its octets, sextets, and uh, its charges and its dominant decays. Again, let's go back to light digest resonances and look at limits, right? So the experimental constraints before uh, 
before CMS started doing some very fancy, uh, fancy work in this, were not particularly encouraging in this mass range. So there were these old uh, UA2 CDF uh, limits that really went down to, so this is for a leptophobic Z prime. Again, when you look at this coupling, this is a bit misleading. When you redo it in terms of cross-section, this cross-section is about 10 to the power 3 picoban, and that's because it's just a Z. It's just a Z boson and nothing else with a coupling sitting here. So this, when you retranslate in cross-section, this is huge. And the problem, again, as always, is that the background here is significantly large. Even CMS and Atlas with the current data has not, did not reach this. So CMS did something very interesting, and I don't really understand this method. So maybe Deepak can give us a hands-on. Oh, you're sorry, you're Atlas. But you, you are also using, uh, do you use data scouting? Okay. I don't really understand how they do, but apparently they record data at, at a speed that allows them to trigger on light objects somehow. And this is, goes by this fancy name of data scouting. And with data scouting, what they did was to dramatically improve this limit in this low mass, in, in, in this patch of the parameter space, that went down to about a GB of 0.3. This is just the coupling to the Z prime. right? And again, I don't know how they really do it, but this is a fancy way of just extracting the, extracting the data from their initial trigger states. Okay, okay, yeah. But it's it's really impressive the, in in the sense that the limits have improved significantly. Um, the second technique, of course, is to radiate this radiate a jet in association with the Z prime. So Z prime goes to a QQ bar. You radiate a jet out of this. This is an energetic jet. This is boosted. So you really you, you can really go further down because you're triggering this high very high energetic jet. And with this, with these parameters, they can go down to about 0 0.05. And this is, again, very impressive. And this is sort of what you can do with substructure methods. You can really go down to these limits. Right, so that's all about limits. So we are sort of at the ballpark where we are sort of here. Let's say the central limit is somewhere here. So this is about 0 0.1. This is, again, in terms of cross-section, this is a huge number. OK, so let's see. If we do see a resonance in this channel, which is producing a Z prime or a resonance in association with a jet, can we use some certain handles to classify these, uh, uh, these resonances, right? So let's introduce these jet energy coelters. Okay, so this is a complicated formula. So what it really does is to take two point correlators, okay? So, you, so this is defined in terms of energy, but you can very well define this in terms of PT. And I, for all that I will do is to define these, uh, so I'll write them down as in terms of PT. So what they are is really 2 point, 3 point, 4 point correlators or multiplicative correlators of energies and some function of angles that look at how things radiate, essentially. This sum runs over, if you're looking at a full event, it can run over all tracks. If you're looking at jets, it can run over all subjects in a system. If you write them down carefully, the first zero point correlator is just one, nothing else, because this exponent is zero. You're, this, you're summing over just one object, it's just one. The first correlator is just a sum of the PTs, so HT, if you like. The second correlator has this interesting structure where it's two point correlation between PTs, and then it's the distance between the two, P, uh, two objects. The three point correlator goes further, it looks at three, and then it looks at pairwise objects. What's the lesson out of all of this? The lesson is that it's not just the PTs. You're also looking at point-by-point point structures of how things radiate, uh, ra radiate uh, outward. So let's see if I can apply this. But before that, let's also define some interesting things. So first, and by the way I'm going, so people who are familiar with JET algorithms would realize something called n subjectiveness and the way of defining n subjectiveness in uh, in systems. So first define this ratio, which is just taking an n plus one point correlator, dividing that by n, 
and then define the dimensional rest ratio of these two. And this looks close to what you would call a uh, correlation or uh, uh, an, an n subjectiveness with the, uh, with the caveat that the n subjectiveness function does not have this angular exponent. Okay? That's all that I want, to, uh, want you to take for. For example, if you look at C1 beta, I've again written this in terms of uh, C uh, in terms of energy, but you can write it in terms of PTs. So this has this two point this two point uh, energy fun PT function, and something that tells you what is the pairwise angle between the first two jets or every jet, let's say. So let's look at this from a very QCD perspective. So C1 beta, if you work it out, is nothing but a splitting function between two objects, an angular exponent raised to this, ex uh, an angular variable raised to this exponent beta. If you resum this, so you resum this observable, you would notice that this resum distribution has this very interesting form, which is a logarithm, which is this logarithm, and the discriminant, you can just define it in terms of these Cs. So these Cs are nothing but Cas and Cfs. So if you're looking at a quark versus a gluon, you can find a very simple discriminant between two objects, which is the C over CF, right? And this it has been done by both CMS and Atlas. This is just looking at QCD jets, and you can distinguish between quarks and gluons. Okay, so quark jets are always peaked at smaller. Uh, no, so this is Pythia, but CMS and Atlas have both actually done this on data, so they can distinguish it at some level. Of course, depends on the process. They have actually used it for Higgs to discriminate backgrounds against Higgs. Okay. Again, like I said, this should be sensitive to wide angle emission. You write this down, and this is again a complicated slide, but let's say, let's look at this from a slightly interesting point of view. So let's say my hard, my hard process is E1, so this is the resonance, and I emit two softer objects, which is this E2 and E3. Again, I write down all my correlators, okay? So this is just writing down two-point correlators, three-point correlators, and defining this double ratio. If you then look at n subjectiveness, so remember I said that the energy correlation function has an explicit dependence on the angle, and this is not true in case of, uh, in, in case of n subjectiveness variables. And this is apparent when you write, when you write these down in explicitly. Okay? You just have to do some simple mathematics, and you end up by do looking at this n subjectiveness variable, which although minimizes this distance measure, if you look at this ratio, it never depends on explicitly on some uh, beta parameters. Whereas if you look at the C2 beta, so this is the second correlator, there's an explicit dependence between the opening angle. And this opening angle is all that you need to really cl cl to, to uh, dis discriminate between things. So if you are looking at soft subjects, this is not subject, this is subject, you realize that the energy correlators have an advantage over n subjectiveness in this, in this way that it captures this leading radiation better. Okay? If you're looking at a jet mass, for example, the jet mass is then has a dominance that C2 penalizes for small values of Z, which is the splitting function, which is the first small uh, emission from the leading uh, object. So QCD backgrounds peak at small values of Z, and this is where you can really use it to discriminate between uh, objects that don't look like QCD, but peaks at larger values. Okay, again, let's go back to the cheat sheet and look at all these resonances. And again, you will realize that certain things have a certain color structure, and I can use these correlators in the way that there is an opening angle dependence on how it radiates, and I can use this to construct my correlators for each of these models. And so that's what I will do next. But before that, let's just look at the event simulation. So this is something that we took right out of the CMS paper and implemented it. Uh, we sort of got to ballpark numbers of CMS, so we were sort of kind of sure that our simulations were working fine. Mm -hmm. uh, we used this full, full gamut of uh, what you can do with uh, with uh, uh, Monte Carlo tools, and let's just look at first collator. Okay? The first collator is extremely simple. The first collator is just the R, the separation between the two leading jets, and just by looking at how and so that depends if, 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 if the mass is the same. And for all these cases, all these models, I take the mass to be 250 GeV. The best you can, so the, the principal difference between these is just PT. So depending on how it's produced, 
It will have different things will have slightly different PTs, and that's something that you see bin by bin, right? So all objects that are produced with a dimension uh, with a uh, with a higher dimensional operator will have slightly larger PTs, and they they will sort of shift towards this side. QCD, as you can see, is significantly different bin by bin, and different objects depending on how they are produced, what is the initial state, will have slightly different PT dependencies. So this is the simplest thing that you can do, and this just depends on PT and nothing else. But now you have higher point coerters, and let's say I produce an object X, and I radiate, a, and I radiate this object, uh, an, a gluon, right? You can then write down these C2s and C3s, and if you look at C2s, you would realize, so this epsilon is nothing but the, nothing but the ratio of the soft jet over the hard radiation. So since this is small, so this is really at the limit of a soft and coordinate emission, it peaks at zero because it's really small, zero or close to zero because it's really small, and it should go closer to zero. C3 beta, as you will see, that it only depends on, co on, on opening angles, and there's no PT dependence at the initial state. So this should shift away from zero. So this is at parton level, right? And at parton level, you only have the hard process plus the, ra plus the significant radiation. But then showering affects a lot of things. And this is how things look like when you shower. And this is a plot of C2. And you can see that all these resonances are very well separated now, right? So they are very well separated. And bin by bin, they are. So C2, for example, you, ha you, you, you can see, make sure that how this works. QCD, which is a color octate, spreads out because it radiates more. It has wide angle emission. Um, uh, so the next one is, of course, if you look at octates, so scalar octet, for example, it's highly radiative, so it goes, it fo almost follows QCD. Spin 2, which is a scalar, has significantly lower radiation, so it always peaks this way. Z prime, which is a, which is a, uh, which is a vector but colorless, has absolutely no color information, so it peaks close to zero. You can separate, and a combination of these two can then separate out all the resonances, bin by bin, effectively very well. All you have to do is look at the size of the peak, and you have to do a two-dimensional bin likelihood. Okay. And that's what we do. So let's look at a two-dimensional likelihood with both C2 and C3. And so these horizontal lines, so since the current exclusion of GB is around 1.5 at a mass of 250 GV, we take a value of GB which is 0.6. So that gives you a cross-section of 25 hectoburn inverse. This cross-section is about a picobarn. Um, so with a 25 femtobarn cross-section, which is much lower than what the current exclusion is, we look at how well we can distinguish. So all we do is a bin likelihood, bin by bin, and uh, we look at how well this can discriminate. So you see that the largest discrimination comes from this one. So this is a Z prime versus an excited quark. The Z prime does not have any color structure, right? The excited quark is a sextet, and plus it also has some momentum dependence coming from, a, uh, coming, from, uh, coming from its operator structure. So a combination of a lot of things, mostly radiation, helps it to distinguish. And you can see that you can distinguish it with already about 100 femtobarn inverse luminosity. So if you, had to, if you discovered an object, you could tell them apart at this luminosity. Okay. The most problematic is, of course, looking at a diquark versus an x-quark. This is a triplet. This is, an, uh, this, is a, this is a sextet. The color structures are almost similar. For the region of parameter space we are looking at, this is the most hard to discriminate, right? And then you have these limits depend, and then you have these various uh, various curves depending on where you are in terms of your color and momentum structure. These vertical lines are basically s by square root three and four, and these are just uh, five. These are just discovery reaches for this cross section, uh, for these cross sections. And yeah, so that's basically what I had to really say. So the message out of all of this is that you can really use different handles to discriminate light digit resonances in the sense that if you really looked at its operator structure, its color, its color structure, how it's produced, how it decays, you can construct effective variables that can discriminate, once, uh, discriminate things. Not just that, if you looked at these plots and you saw that QCD was significantly different from all of these, you can even use these variables to suppress background. Okay? And that's something that CMS has already done, in fact. Uh, they have looked at these, and they have tried to uh, optimize, these, optimize, to, uh, optimize these variables to uh, 
to do to suppress background what we do is go a step further we say that it's just just not discovery but you can also use this to discriminate um yeah so that's look i'm way way ahead of time uh so open for discussion so my conclusions are really so these are powerful probes of resonances uh they can be used to discriminate on the basis of the carlin momentum structure and this is also a powerful tool to suppress standard model background so what can we do uh so one of the things that you can always ask is that okay i i i looked at a few scenarios where you can use these uh, subjectiveness variables or correlation variables to look at uh, to to discriminate between objects but these are not optimized right so one of the things that i did not optimize over is this exponent beta so this exponent beta is really a weighting factor in the sense that as you increase ex the exponent things get separated more but there's an al always an optimum optimum beta for which this is, this is done and this is something that we did not perform this is something that we one has to look at one has to also look at regions of parameter space where maybe the in subjectness or jet energy profiles may be more interesting uh, to look at and this is also something that is ongoing so what we are really looking at is a optimizing over the ang angular exponent one can what uh, what something that one can also do is if you're looking at if you're really looking at the subjects of these resonances you can really map these in a machine learning uh, over a machine learning technique in the sense that you look at a object and you look at all kinds of objects inside this fat jet and you can image this in a strictly machine learning sense and that's also something that we are looking at uh, can you optimize over a large number of jet observables can you do imaging techniques can you optimize over uh, a large number of large set of parameters uh, that that are there to really pinpoint pin down the and pin down the nature of the resonance so this is future plans and certain some things that are in progress right now okay and i promise to leave you with this guy so